So our scripture lesson today is coming from Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 38. This is the New International Version. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes up by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me again? Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd come now and use me as your vessel uh, to, to speak, to sing, to just whisper your grace into people's lives. Help me not to get in the way of anything you want to uh, say to people. Uh, and I pray that they would receive these words as from you and that they would apply it to you, your, their lives and you'd correct any mistakes I make along the way. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a child, a family friend uh, gave me a book because uh, he knew I liked to read historical things. So he gave me a book of uh, uh, historical epitaphs and also the famous last words of famous people. Uh, it was the kind of old book you'd get for a quarter at a library book sale, but I love that book, and I read it over and over again. Uh, you know what last words are, but an epitaph, you may not know, that's the words you typically find on the tombstone of a person, and I found those particularly fascinating. I remember the ones that I thought were funny, and so, for example, I uh, once said, here lies Butch, we planted him raw. He was quick on the trigger, but slow on the draw. <laughs> here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. This one, can you imagine being dissed on your gravestone? The memory of Beza Wood. Here lies one wood, enclosed in wood, one wood within another. The outer wood is very good. We cannot praise the other. Ouch. I like this one. Under the sod and under the trees lies the body of Jonathan Pease. He's not here. There's only the pod. Pease shelled out, gone home to God. He got it. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the grass, gas instead of the break. <laughs> Sorry, gas. Uh, and this one was probably put by a family member with some agenda. It said, here lies an atheist, dressed up with no place to go, right? Now, for that same book, there was also famous last words of people, and some of those I want to share with you. When Ethan Allen, the American revolutionary hero, was dying, uh, they said, General, I fear the angels are waiting for you. And he said, waiting are they, let them wait. And then he died. <laughs> The composer Beethoven's last words, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. The actor Humphrey Bogart said something pretty pro profane or crass. He said, I should have never switched from martinis, uh, to, from scotch to martinis, his last words. General Stonewall Jackson said, let us cross over the river and sit in the shade of the trees. The last words of Oscar Wilde were, either that wallpaper goes or I do. He went. <laughs> Nathan Hale was hung by uh, the British during the Revolutionary War, and he said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Here at Tubman of Underground Railroad fame said, swing low, sweet chariot. You know the rest of that song, right? Coming for to carry me home. John Wesley, the spiritual leader of the uh, Methodist movement, uh, is reported to have said, the best of all, God is with us. And then he started to sing a song, I'll praise him, I'll praise him. And then he looked around and said, farewell. Now, part of the calling and privilege I have as a pastor is to be able to share with families in the intimate moments of dying, uh, their own death or the death of their loved ones. I get invited into spaces uh, that I really have no right to go to try to be of some comfort to represent the church in some way. And in those moments, I've noticed how people are hanging on every word their loved ones, like they probably should have been hanging on every word over the course of their life, but they're hanging on every word spoken in those moments. Oftentimes I come in to a hospice room or a hospital room and they're just crowded around, even with their ear right next to that person's mouth, trying to catch every little whisper, every final parting word. The other thing I've noticed is those final words sometimes can be very profound and very revealing. Now, of course, not always so. Sometimes in the case of dementia or under heavy medication or feverishness or other things, the words don't reflect. People say things that are horrifying, uh, and the family should just dismiss that. They're not in their right minds. But in other cases, 
That's, that the final words are like an x-ray that reveal the heart and the mind of that person, their spirit, the profound words that we ought to take to heart. Of all the final words that have ever been spoken, none are more precious or more revealing than the words that Jesus spoke as he was dying on the cross. And so in the season of Lent leading up to Easter, I'm going to focus on uh, the traditional words that Jesus said from the various gospels as he was dying on the cross. And as we examine his words, I believe we can better, get a better sense of who he was and why he did what he did and how that applies to each of our lives. Now, we need to remember, of course, that Jesus didn't speak his dying words uh, from a hospital bed or from a, a comfortable hospice room or even at his own home, surrounded by his family and friends. He was in anguish. He was on the cross. He was dying, uh, fully present in that moment, speaking words that were profound. So I want us to, to begin with the first words that he spoke, and I want you to see it's kind of, you can diagram it out, and you know that it's a prayer. It's a prayer. And so he addressed it to someone, this statement. He offers a request. It has a definite object. And then he cites a reason. So I'm going to look at these four parts of this prayer. First of all, Jesus said, Father. He said, Father. So in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called God Father 17 times. And in John 14, he discusses his impending death. And he says, I go ahead to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many dwelling places or many mansions. In other words, I'm going to make that ready so you can come after me. And you'll see in a few weeks, the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So I think it's important to note that even after all that he'd gone through to this point and even what he was going through on the cross, he still had that relational connection to the Father in his humanity. He's fully God, fully man, but he's fully human. And so he's modeling for us what that connection, what that relationship should look like. He looked up in his anguish, and he said, Father. He kept his focus on that relational connection, and he knew that God is good, and God has a plan. As I alluded to in my prayer, sometimes we have bad experiences with our parents, bad experience with fathers, and so we think, if God is anything like my father, I don't want anything to do with him. God's nothing like earthly fathers, even at their best. God is good, and God is perfect, and we have to just know that. And God wants to have that kind of relationship with us that's nurturing and supportive and caring. And so Jesus didn't doubt that. Even in the midst of his anguish, he knew that this was his father in whom that was well pleased with him in his life. And this is a good reminder because when life is painful, sometimes we, we think that God isn't good or that God doesn't love us, that we're somehow being punished. We don't believe that God is working in all things for our good. It's, we struggle. When things are wonderful, it's easy to believe that God loves you. But when life is hard, it's much harder. And so we just have to choose that. By faith, we have to decide in advance that that's what we know to be true about God. And what we know is greater than our feelings. What we know about God is that God is good, and God is our Father, and God loves us. Someone has said, when life knocks you to your knees, you're in a great position to pray and to look up to God. Jesus looked up to God, and he found a loving Father. And you need to look up to God and find a loving Father that cares for you. The next thing we notice is that Jesus' prayer from the cross involved a specific request. He said, Father, forgive. Father, forgive. And the Greek word that's used for forgive here it can be used in different ways in ancient biblical literature. Sometimes the word forgive means to permit. I'll, I'll forgive you. You can go. I, I, you permit someone. You permit them. So Jesus is saying, Father, permit them to do this to me. Now, why would such a prayer be needed? Jesus said something very interesting in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26 before he went to the cross. He said to those that were coming to arrest him, don't you realize that I could call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Many people think that a sacrifice was really made in the garden before the cross because there he submitted to the plan of God, the plan of God to redeem all of humanity by his sacrifice on the cross. He submitted to that because he believed it was worth it. It was worth it because God's holy wrath and justice had to be satisfied, and it could be satisfied that way or by the punishment of every human being on the whole face of the earth. He thought it was worth it to satisfy the justice of God, and he also thought that you were worth it. As undeserving of grace as you might be, he thought you were worth it. And so he said, Father, permit them 
to do this to me. And I think it's interesting to imagine uh, something of this in your mind's eye. With the crucifixion already in progress, I imagine that he could see through the veil between earth and heaven, and he could see that legions of angels just kind of straining at the leash, only waiting for a word from the Son or from the Father to swoop down and rescue the beloved Son of heaven. Maybe the angels knew, maybe they understood why it was necessary, but that couldn't have made it easy to watch from their point of view and from the power that they had. Our our oldest son broke his leg uh, badly up here when he was just two years old. So we took him to the hospital, and I was with him in the room as they had to set the bone and put him into traction. And I knew it had to happen, and I was braced for it, but when I heard my son cry out in pain, it was all I could do to keep from hitting the doctor. I mean, the nurse had to kind of hold me back. I just lunged forward without even thinking. It must have been hard for the angels to watch, and they had to want to put a stop to it. But in fact, Jesus was saying, Father, hold them back and permit this to proceed. Permit this. Forgive them. Forgive them. They are not taking my life from me. I am laying it down of my own free will. It is necessary if people are to be saved. Now, the word forgive can also mean to satisfy a debt. So Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them by condemning me in their place. Jesus did not ask the Father to ignore sin or to justify it some other way. A holy and just God could not ignore sin. It had to be paid for some way or another. And Jesus said, let their sin be put on me, and by my sacrifice may they be forgiven. See, God's ultimate holiness demanded a perfect sacrifice, and only Jesus could represent human beings and represent God at the same time. And so he had the authority to pray, Father, forgive Father, forgive. Now, the form of the Greek word here is in the imperfect tense, which means it's uh, something that's repetitive. So you could translate verse 38 as, he kept saying, Father, forgive. He kept saying, Father, give. In other words, he prayed it over and over again. Maybe only once out loud. We don't know. Maybe he was praying the rest of the time silently, but he's praying, Father, forgive him. So he arrives at the place of Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. He arrives there and he says, Father, forgive. The centurion pushes him to the ground and ropes his arms to the cross beam, and he says, Father, forgive. They, they drive spake, spikes into his hands, and he says, Father, forgive. They nail his feet to the cross, and he says, Father, forgive. They lift up that timber to drop it down in a slot in a way that would have to rattle his bones, and he prayed, Father, forgive. When the crowd cursed him and mocked him, he prayed, Father, forgive. When the soldiers took his clothing and gambled over his robe, he prayed, Father, forgive. He prayed it over and over again, and he's still doing it. He's still doing it. He's still praying that prayer right now. In Romans 8.35, it says, Christ Jesus, who died and was raised to life, is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Interceding? What does that mean? Praying for us. Praying for us. And what is he praying? Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Next, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Now, who is he referring to when he says this? Now, certainly it's to the people right then and there, uh, the religious leaders, the Roman leaders, the soldiers, everybody that had worked together uh, to conspire to his crucifixion, those that were committing it, the people mocking him, jeering him, ignoring him, all of them, uh, think of it this way. The person who was the victim of the worst crime in history was forgiving the criminals even as they were committing the crime. Someone has said that Christ prayed for his friends while he was alive, but he prayed for his enemies as he was dying. And I believe his prayer for forgiveness, as I've alluded to already, included more than the religious leaders, more than the Romans, more than the people at the time. It's much broader. I believe it includes you and me, every one of us, and every person throughout the sweep of history, for all of us need God's grace. I'm saying that as he was dying on the cross, he was thinking of you. And you can imagine that word as a word to you. Father, forgive them. Take out the word them. Imagine a blank there and put your name in that spot. Father, forgive you. Father, forgive me. He prayed that prayer, and then he died to make it possible for that forgiveness to be received. Now, we know from history that when a person was crucified uh, by the Romans, they would be marched through the city, and they would have a sign hung around their neck that would list their crimes. Uh, It would be another weight to kind of drag them down after they'd been beaten and abused in different ways. So he had this a sign hung around his neck. Then when they got to the place of crucifixion, they'd take that sign off and they would nail it to the cross over the head of the person. Now we know what a sign says. In verse 38, it said, the king of the Jews. So basically he's being accused of treason, 
Caesar as the king, uh, the religious leaders thought he was blasphemous because he wasn't really the Messiah, all of that. But spiritually, I think there was something else written there. Spiritually, I think something else was written there. I think it was a list of your sins and mine. I like the way Max Lucado sometimes turns a phrase, and so I want to share something he wrote in one of his books. There was a long list, a list of our mistakes, our lusts and lies and greedy moments and prodigal years, a list of our sins. Nailed to the cross was an itemized catalog of your sins, my sins, the bad decision from last year, the bad attitudes from last week, there in broad daylight for all of heaven to see a list of our sins. But in a very real sense, the list cannot be read. It's covered. The sins are hidden. They're covered by his blood. As Colossians 2.14 says, your sins are blotted out. He has forgiven you all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the written evidence of broken commandments, which always hung over our heads, and has completely annulled it by nailing it to a cross. He continues, this is why when it came time to drive a nail through Jesus' hand, he did not resist. He saw the list. He saw your list. He knew the price of those sins was death. Jesus knew the source of those sins was you. And since he couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you, he chose the nails. Hear that again. He knew the price of those sins was death. Jesus knew the source of those sins was you. And since he couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you, he chose the nails. And finally, notice that Jesus shared a reason for his prayer. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In other words, they don't realize the significance of their act. We would say today that they're clueless. Now, don't misunderstand. They knew a lot. Judas knew that he had betrayed a friend and the best leader he could ever have. Caiaphas knew that he had resorted to bribery and illegal tricks to trap Jesus. The chief priest knew that they had brought false charges against him. Uh, they may not have believed what he claimed to be true about him, but this punishment didn't deserve this crime. Pilate knew that he was condemning an innocent person to death. The soldiers in the crowd knew that they were being sadistic and cruel. I don't care what a person does. You can never justify that level of cruelty is anything but sin. But they were ignorant in the sense that they didn't see the opportunity for grace that was available to them in that moment. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 2.8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so that day, the Romans and the religious leaders tried to justify their actions. They couldn't, they wouldn't see the big pictures. They didn't realize the opportunity they had in Christ. They didn't know their great need for him to be their savior. They thought they had it figured out. They, they knew what they were doing. They had a plan to save themselves, and they didn't have time to trust in Jesus. They were lost people doing what lost people do. Now, that doesn't relieve them of their responsibility. No one can ever plead ignorance of the law or ignorance of all of this. We're responsible for our sins, and that's why Jesus has to pray, Father, forgive, because apart from that pleading, apart from that sacrifice, apart from that blood, we would have no hope of ever receiving reconciliation with God. So Jesus looked at them in their lostness, in their brokenness, in their hatefulness, and he didn't return hate for hate. Instead, he said he had compassion, and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. When we're lost in sin, when we failed or fallen in any way, Christ sees us the same way, and he sees everyone else the same way as well. So when you hear these words of Jesus, hear them as words of compassion for you, and for everyone around you, and then trust in Christ, the basis for that compassion. So it works like this. When we trust in Christ, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. We're adopted into the family of God, and we become children of God. And now that we're in that home and in that family, we learn how to live different. We learn to see people and to see ourselves as God sees us. We learn to love other people the way God loves us. And when we follow in that way, will grow in grace, both the receiving and the giving. So Christ is our example. How should we treat people that have hurt us with their words and their actions? We should pity them, we should pray for them, and then we should forgive them and leave justice to God. Now I want to share a story. I didn't intend to share this. It wasn't in my notes, but the Spirit's just been prompting me uh, this morning in the last service, and I'll do it here again. Uh, this is hard. 
Uh, I remember many years ago, a woman came up to me after a service and she said, you keep saying, what would Jesus do? But you keep forgetting I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and it's hard for me. And I said, it's hard for me too, sister. So many years ago at another church, a person came into my office, as I alluded to last week, people come in and confess things to me. He came into my office and said uh, that he had been abusing his children. Uh, I was abused as a child, so that kind of struck a nerve with me. And I just kind of patiently listened to him uh, tell his whole story. He'd already been caught. He was facing justice and all of that, so I didn't have to report him. I was just listening to his story. And as I was listening to the story, what he didn't realize is that in my mind, I was imagining if I could lock the door and beat him to death before anybody came in, and then I could say that he was attacked me and I was just defending myself. That was going on in my head the whole time he was talking. And he kept talking, and I didn't do any of that, of course, and I didn't say any of that. What I said instead is, if you repent of your sin and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can receive forgiveness, and I encourage you to do that. God loves you, and so do I. And he said, I know God loves me. I've always known that God loves me. I don't have any problem with the love of God. And he said it so flippantly, <laughs> so carelessly, abused the grace in that attitude that I just couldn't resist saying, listen, you don't get it. It's the grace of God in me that's preventing me from reaching across this table and breaking your neck right now. You're a monster, and what you've done is monstrous. What you deserve is to go to prison for the rest of your life and then to burn in hell forever. <laughs> what you need to do is admit what you've done, plead guilty, accept the penalty, do your time, trust in Jesus, live for him in prison, and all of that, and then maybe I'll see you in heaven, and maybe we'll be friends. That's the best I could do on that day. But I share with them the love. I share with them the grace. Hard. I'm not Jesus. It's the best that I could do. It's hard sometimes to forgive, but we have to try to forgive and leave justice to God. What's the best ending for a story like that? Did a person burn in hell? Is that the best ending? The best ending for a story like that is a person is redeemed. So they turn around and praise God and help other people and minister to other people and show what God can do to make you not bitter, but better. God needs to share that grace and God does that with people that, that don't deserve it. People like me and people like you. And I've shared many times that my favorite verse in scripture or the first one I memorized at least is Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And it's that last part that gets me every time. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. In other words, I have to remember that I was forgiven one day when I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything as monstrous as maybe some other people have done, but I've done plenty to deserve an eternity in hell. And so God has given me grace. He's asked me to receive that grace through faith in Christ, and then he tells me to share that grace with other people. So I want to share a story of a person that does that better than me. I read it in a book called uh, Improving Your Sir by Chuck Swindle many years ago. First book I was given as a Christian, uh, been really formative to me. But a young seminarian named Aaron, who was a student at Chicago's Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and he was in his second year of seminary, so he had one more year to go, and it was the summer after his second year, and he thought, now I'm, I'm trained up, I'm ready to have a, an important ministry, so he started applying around at various churches for a summer job or an after-school job, and he wanted to have some significant ministries. God, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything you want me to do, I just want to serve you uh, in ministry, and he couldn't find any job at all. Finally, he got to a place where I got to have some job, so the only job he could find was driving a bus on the south side of Chicago. And after learning the route, uh, they sent him off as a young rookie on his own in a dangerous neighborhood. And uh, a gang of young guys understood that he was inexperienced, decided to take advantage of him. So they started making fun of him, uh, refusing to pay, uh, abusing the other people on the bus in various ways. And he put up with it for a long time. And then finally one day, he saw a police officer by the side of the road. So he stopped the bus, yelled at the police officer. The police officer came onto the bus, told those men that they had to pay or get off the bus. They paid, but then the police officer got got off the bus and those criminals stayed on the bus. So he went a few more corners and they pulled him out of his chair and beat him half to death. Uh, and so he woke up, the bus was empty, the money was gone. Uh, he went back, he was able to drive back to the station. They gave him the weekend off. And then as he sat there kind of nursing his wounds, his spiritual pain was tremendously great as well. God, how could you let this happen? I'm your servant. I'm your minister. I was willing to do whatever you asked me to do, to go over you wherever you wanted me to go. How could you allow this to happen? Is this the thanks I get? 
Well, on the Monday after that, uh, they, uh, a lawyer called and persuaded him to press charges against the guy, the officer that had come on the bus, and the other witnesses identified them, and they'd been rounded up, and there was going to be a preliminary hearing. But as Aaron came into the courtroom and looked at the gang that day, he had an opposite emotion to what he thought he would have. What he had was compassion for them. He saw them, as I said, as lost people doing what lost people do. He decided people that would do something like that can't know the love of God. You couldn't do that if you know the love of God. So these are people who need the love of God. And so he, he prayed for them, and when he saw that they were people that needed his help, instead of more hatefulness and more condemnation, he, he had a love for them that he didn't have before. And so the judge, they pleaded, uh, took a plea bargain, and said, we're going to go to jail. Uh, but he stepped up and said, can I address the court? And the judge allowed it. So he stood up and said, judge, I'd like you to add up all the years uh, that are due to these men and let me to pay the price in their place. And the, the lawyers were shocked, the gang members were shocked, the judge was shocked, and he says, it's because I forgive them. I forgive them. Uh, and the judge finally regained his composure and said, no, of course not. Nothing like that has ever been done. And the young man said, yes, it has been done. It was done 1,900 years ago when Jesus Christ paid the penalty that all of our sins deserved as a way to share the grace of God. And then the judge allowed him for several minutes, uninterrupted, to share the gospel with everyone in that courtroom. Now, when he was done, the judge didn't grant his request, but he did start visiting those gang members in prison, and he led most of them to faith in Christ. And he discovered that God had called him to a ministry on a bus on the south side of Chicago. And over the course of that summer and the next several years, he led many people uh, to saving faith in Christ. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a powerful prayer, powerful reminder of God's love for us and God's love for everyone else, no matter what we've done or failed to do, that prayer reminds us that God loves us and God loves everyone else, so God wants us to share that love. So I want to end with some questions. First of all, are the things you've done, are there things that you've done in your life that are weighing you down with a sense of guilt and shame? You just have a kind of recurring tape in your head that says you're worthless, you're useless, you're a failure. You, you have that kind of thing going on, which you need to hear is the word of Jesus spoken to you, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And to hear in that the love that God has for you. On the other hand, are you bitter and angry toward people that have hurt you? The people that abused me when I was a child, I decided one day, because of Christ, I could be bitter, I could be better, and I had to learn to forgive them. It's easier for me to forgive things that have been done to me than have been done to other people that I consider innocent. But I reached that place. Are you at a place of bitterness and a place of anger? Hear the word of Christ to those people. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So my final questions are these. Can you accept the forgiveness and the love that God has for you? Repentance, faith, transformation, new life, eternity. It's available to everyone who believes. And next, can you share that grace once you've received it with the people around you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we live in a generation, and maybe it's true in other generations, I don't know, I wasn't there. But I know in our generation, we're surrounded by people who think when they hear that God loves them, they say, well, of course he does. I'm a lovable person, I'm a good person. I'm basically good deep down. I'm at least better than this person or that person. And we don't realize, Lord God, that the standard for goodness is Christ. <laughs> the standard for goodness is your own holiness. And by that measure, whether we miss by an inch or miss by a mile, we miss, we fall short of your glorious holiness and standard. And so, Lord God, we are loved by you as a miracle, a miracle of grace that you could love us, that you could forgive us, that you could redeem us and restore us. We don't deserve it, it's, it's incredible. And Lord God, when we really come to grips with that, when we come to grips with the undeserved nature of that, then we praise you and then we thank you and then we serve you and then we live for you and then we make the hard decisions of our relationships with other people and we find a way to share grace with people when that's not what we feel like doing in our sinful nature, we allow our Christ-like nature to drive our lives. Lord God, make that change in us humble us so we can turn to you and then lift us up 
full of grace that we're able then to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.